Now playing in a world where we're not sure if we want to go back to the theaters. Well, you know, as I always say, if you're within the sound of my voice, that must mean you're in the seats with once more. But I'm actually not in the seats right now. I'm on vacation. You're hearing something taped, but we're doing something a little different right now. While while I'm away from the desk, we're calling it the Critics' Corner. We're just... Uh, we're, we're pulling into the archives that are so deep, which are, you know, Netflix and Crave and Amazon and God knows what, to, to find those little gems that kind of fall through the cracks. And we're, and we're sitting down with uh, some of our contemporaries just to talk about those movies that, you know, you need to see. Because quite frankly, if you, if you want to sit here and tell us that, you know, you've seen everything on Netflix or Prime or Crave, we're here to tell you that you're lying. But on this one, we are talking with our good friend, Mr. Norm Wilner. Norm, how are you doing today, brother? I'm good. Thank you for having me. It's uh, It's been raining all day, so it's nice to just not uh, not have to listen to that and, and put headphones in and do a podcast, <laughs> honestly. I, I hope it doesn't uh, start up again because the studio is notorious for that in here. Oh, fingers really crossed, man. It really starts. But uh, I guess, you know, tell, I mean, you are a friend of the show, obviously, but just <laughs> do me a favor and tell the world where they can find you because, I mean, you're doing more work than I am at this stage. It doesn't feel like it. Um, I got to say, let's see, I write for Now Magazine, so I review film and television, mostly television these days at nowtoronto.com slash movies. I also do a podcast for now called Now What, which is uh, on every podcast platform you can find under Now Toronto. And I have my own thing, Someone Else's Movie, which is a podcast that I really love, where I talk to writers, directors, actors, filmmakers, nebulous industry figures about the movies that they love, but that someone else made. So it's pure advocacy, and you can find that on the podcast platform of your choice and at uh, Frequency Podcast Network as well. Fantastic. So yeah, okay. When when I when I run it all out like that, that is a lot of work. <laughs> but on this one, we're actually diving into Netflix Canada, and we're going back to 2018. And I remember this movie because you, I, you and I were in the same screening, and I think yeah. you and I may have been the only people who actually enjoyed this movie. Uh, it is called Hotel Artemis. Could you just tell us a little bit about sort of the premise of the film? Yeah, it's um. It's my favorite kind of genre movie. It's a mashup picture. It's Reservoir Dogs and John Wick and The Purge thrown in a blender together with an incredibly overqualified cast. Uh, like Jodie Foster is the lead and Sterling K. Brown is the co-lead. Dave Bautista is in it. Sophia Butella. Uh, Butella, I'm always mispronouncing her name. I, free, I fear uh, Charlie Day, um, Zachary Quinto, a couple of other people whose names I don't even want to disclose because they show up late in the movie. And it does that thing where... It's a it's effectively an ensemble film. There is a point of view character, and we see it through Jodie Foster's eyes. But mostly, it's just about rolling out new complications and new people into this story as it unfolds over one night in Los Angeles in 2027 or 2028, where the city is coming apart. Martial law is finally happening. There are water riots. The world is ending, and one tiny story is unfolding for us, and that is that somewhere. In downtown LA, at the top of a skyscraper, there is a secret medical clinic for really, really rich criminals. And it's kind of like John Wick in that you have to have a membership and that there the are rules that everyone has to follow. But everyone in this space is kind of a dirtbag, even though, you know, it's got your classic um, good, uh, bad guy, good reason situation where Sterling K. Brown's character is a bank robber who tried to help his brother. It all went terribly wrong. And now he's brought his his mortally wounded brother to this building where they can be treated but also he runs into an old flame who's there under her own reasons she's been injured she's shown up and she's got an agenda that he's not fully privy to and there's another guy and he's a complete jerk and that's charlie day's character and he's basically uh he's a he's a very wealthy arms dealer who believes that because he has platinum membership he deserves access to everything and everybody gets on everybody else's nerves but they're all bandaged and bleeding and limited and it's really really clever in the ways that um the the writer director drew pierce keeps pitting individual pairings against each other so there'll be dialogue scenes between two characters but he just keeps switching up the mix of who's talking to whom and what's going on and what's being accomplished and meanwhile Jodie Foster's running around trying to keep everybody alive and uh, Dave Bautista who is her orderly is sort of just grumpily helping her and making sure other people don't kill each other just out of you know because the nuts are in the wrong place in the in the uh in the lounge right. it's like being trapped in a hotel with people you can't stand except you're also all hooked up to ivs and 
disarmed. It's it's just really smart. It's really fun. And I remember watching it and thinking, yeah, no, this is this is what I love about um about all of the genre stuff that seems so played out. If you're clever enough to put two pieces together in just the right way, you get a whole new movie out of it. And you can make people enjoy themselves. No, you're and I mean you're absolutely right. And I mean it's one of those things that I mean, ironically enough, in watching this movie, I kind of think back to uh, the reason why Jodie Foster took uh, flight plan. I mean, I remember the quote because, like, it basically, her, her her business managers told her to start taking jobs again yeah. because she wasn't working nearly enough. But I mean, if you look through sort of everything that Jodie has done, sort of from like the mid two thousands on, it's like she she very clearly just doesn't give a damn anymore she's gonna do something she finds interesting we sort of you know against type or with type because i mean this was 2018 and we didn't see her again until this year in in the the mauritanian that's right so well it's only a couple of years right i mean mauritanian was shot before the pandemic it was supposed to be released in 2020 it's it's not that long i think i do think though that she's just in a position where she just doesn't need to do anything she's not interested in and Mauritanian is a sort of a public advocacy project she's she's doing it to get some visibility onto this I think everybody made that movie in order to tell the story um and maybe to work with uh with Kevin McDonald but um here I think she just saw a role that she'd never played before and something that looked like fun and it's it's a it's a simple shoot it's just a couple of locations it's very economical it probably wasn't more than three weeks of her time and she's the lead like why wouldn't like it it really it's it's perfectly tailored for her i'd love to talk to drew pierce and find out if he'd written it for her or for someone in her range and just ended up getting her out of luck i want to know yeah like there um gene siskel used to say that uh, you can watch a movie and you know the movie isn't working if you can think about the actors having lunch during the shoot and think oh i'd rather see that I wouldn't rather see that in this case, but I want to know. I'd love to have known what the relationship dynamics were, who had the time, who wanted to work with whom, like who was the hook, who was the one actor they got where everybody else piled on. Cause it could just as well have been Sterling K Brown. That's a, yeah, who, that's distinctly who's, possible. Who's a master player in this. He's just great. And it's perfectly tailored to him as well. Like his skill set of being um, kind of like he's, he's got this amazing intellectual removal quality where he can set himself apart from a situation and try to deal with it. it. It comes up in a few of his roles, but then inevitably the emotions take over and it all gets flooded. And that moment that he plays is always the, the best thing he does. He does it like every other week on This Is Us. But uh, here he's just, he's perfectly cast. He's believable as a criminal mastermind. He's believable as somebody who cares about his brother. He's believable as somebody who has, you know, deep connections with people that he can't act on. And then you watch him scraping up against the goals that everybody else has, like the whole thing is conflict. And it's, it's the cheapest thing to write, right? It's the easiest thing to do in a script is to put people against each other with, with intersecting or, or uh, um, uh, it's like immovable object, irresistible force stuff. You just, those collisions are going to happen in the course of this movie. And in, in this case, some of those collisions aren't even set up until the last reel and they just yeah. keep coming. It's, it's ingenious. I don't want to talk about who shows up at the end. I keep trying. I keep almost getting there. And I was like, no, nope, no, nope, don't say it. And I mean, I mean, another thing about this film that really stood out for me is just it. I kind of marvel at the fact that, I mean, when you look at Drew Pierce's career, especially as a writer, he is a he's a Marvel Mission Impossible, you know, Fast and Furious kind of guy. But yeah. this is the kind of thing they go do when they're trying to do something fun and indie. Yeah, I think the thing that stands out about all of his movies is that his script work is almost certainly like consulting on character and action, like the mixture of that. How do you get the action scenes out of the the existing character sets? Because he's written a lot of sequels. And I think he's really good at nuts and bolts plotting that accommodates individual characters that are already established. Like, you know, um, I would not be surprised at all to learn that he figured out the through line of family on Hobbs and Shaw that isn't, like that isn't the family line from the Fast and the Furious movies. Right. It's just as obsessed with it because they're like both plot lines are about, or both main characters have plot lines where they're reconciling with the strange siblings and accepting who they are within the larger family networks. But I can see him 
coming at it and going, but what's the one thing that's missing from these characters in the Fast and Furious movies? What do we, what do we not know about them? And it's who they are when they're not helping Vin Diesel. Like, who, they must have lives. What do they do? So I could see him coming in and figuring out that opening sequence in Hobbs and Shaw where they're cross-cutting action sequences that are almost identical, except they're on different sides of the Atlantic and a bunch of other stuff is happening. And then figuring out that it all needs to come back to not Shaw's family, but Hobbs' family. I, I interviewed him when... Um, uh, the Iron Man 3 Blu-ray came out because he directed the short film that's on there about the Mandarin. Or maybe that's it was right. on one of the, yeah, yeah. yeah, or maybe it was on one of the other discs. I can't, I no longer remember which one shots are attached to which Blu-ray. But he did one about the Mandarin, I think it's called Hail to the King. Yeah, that's right. He, they they let him write and direct it, and it's just Scoot McNary and and um Ben Kingsley uh in a jail cell talking for 10 minutes. And it's almost exactly like Hotel Artemis, which is this giant story is unfolding around the space that we are seeing. And we're just in one room sinking into the characters and just enjoying the relationships that are formed. And now apparently um, the man, the, the actual Mandarin, because, you know, spoiler for Iron Man 3, Ben Kingsley's not the Mandarin, but the real Mandarin is going to show up in Shang-Chi in The Legend of the Ten Rings. So I have no idea how that fits into everything else, but maybe he had a hand in that too. And I mean, seeing Dave Batista here really does. I mean, it kind of makes me smile because I mean, on one end, so good. He's obviously like he's not playing it as the heavy. He's just playing it as sort of as a character and trying to have some moments of comedy and sort of be fun with it. But I mean, when you look at sort of the the credit arc, because he did uh, twenty forty like Blade Runner twenty forty nine right before this. Yep. Yep. And then it was like Guardians, and he did Bushwick, which he was the lead in, but which nobody saw. It still is not a bad movie. I saw it. It's one of those things. It, it's, it's fine. fine. It's, it's fine. fine. Single take thing gets old. But we it's we see this ramp up to him being sort of this leading guy that I think nobody saw coming until sort of after all this stuff kind of happened. Because I mean, it's the it, it seeing like I mean, I guess from my perspective, like when wrestlers turn into actors, you expect them to be sort of. I mean, there was the Hogan thing, which was one thing, but. I didn't expect this guy to find himself basically in the sort of Roddy Roddy Piper meld of being a character actor, which yeah, is the kind soulful, of what he's trying to do. He's got a soulful hulking thing to him. Yeah. Right. It's the tenderness that you don't see coming. No, that's absolutely right. Yeah. His relationship with Foster is, is lovely. They're just, they're quietly needling each other, but they also obviously really care about each other. And there's a there's a thing he does in Artemis where he's basically he's he sometimes literally carries people, but mostly he just carries a scene yeah. by sort of just he's like a he's like a brace. He shows up and you he's so big, he's so imposing visually that you can't help but pivot to him. You have to focus on what he's doing. Also, he's demonstrated in the first 10 minutes that he's actually pretty funny. So you keep waiting to see what he's going to do. And it's just this great stealth leading man performance in the middle of a film where no one realizes he's not the lead. I mean, he is potentially the hero of the next one, I think, but they're never going to be making sequels to these things. <laughs> but he, he carries the picture in a really small, subtle way because we end up looking to him to see how to feel about a given scene. And when he's not around, you kind of miss him, which I think is the greatest achievement a character actor can can accomplish. No, absolutely. And I mean, not only with him, but I mean, you see a bunch of other people, like without giving away too many spoilers, but like a Brian Tyree Henry or, yeah, a, yeah. or a Jenny Slate or like there are, like you said at the top, th this film is disturbingly overqualified <laughs> how well the cast did. It's, it's one of those weird things that, when you and I go, when we get to go see screenings and see movies, it's like, we may have never heard of the film, but then we'll read the cast list and go, oh shit, there's a lot of people in this movie. Yeah, I didn't even uh, know about the cast list. I, I mean, I knew Jodie Foster was in it. That was the hook yeah. in the press release that I got. But then I just stop. I try not to watch trailers. I try to see movies as cold Thanks. as possible yeah, yeah. just so I can't be expecting things. Um, and half the time, stuff in the trailer doesn't even make it into the finished film in the version that we see it in the trailer. So that's always um, just another complication that I'd rather not deal with. But with this one, it's just like, oh, I love her. I love him. This is great. Oh, this is another person I really like. There's nobody in the movie I don't enjoy watching. And because it's so heavily um, character type based, I don't know how to describe that exactly, but it's a film that's cast with types. We don't even know people's real names. We just, their name for the room that they're staying in. There's an Acapulco and, and uh, Hawaii, I think, and so on. But you um, you have like 10 seconds to figure out who everybody is. Sterling K. Brown and Brian Terry Henry are bad guys. 
Uh, they're both their brother bad guys, but they're robbing a bank and you have 10 seconds to figure out who they are before they put their masks on and go in and rob a bank. And then we meet uh, Butea's, Butella's character. I'm so sorry. Uh, who you know, I've seen her in a dozen movies, but I've never heard her name spoken, which is really weird. Never had the chance to interview her to find out. Um, but she shows up and she has to convey all the things that she brings as a performer, which is her, her dance background, her ballet, um, her, her poise and very also very quickly just the fact that she can kill you with a with a toothpick if she wants to mm. and it's just you need actors who can convey that in just the way they show up to work in the way they're dressed in the way they're 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 positioned in the frame but you need a quick sell on everything and every single one of these characters when when jenny slate shows up as an injured cop you know exactly who this person is who is not going to be like she's, she's a rookie, right? Like she's, a, I think she's ultimately, she's not even a cop. She's like a, uh, a health, public health nurse who's right, yeah. uh, been pulled in and she has to be able to sell that. Like we have to first believe her as a, as a rookie cop. And then we have to understand who she really is and just go for layer after layer after layer of that character as it's, as it's explained to us. And you need somebody who's, who's versatile enough that they can play all of those things and also have the spirit to sell it. I think casting someone who is primarily a comic in a role like that is a great destabilizer because anyone who's seen her in anything before is going to be expecting a comic performance. Uh, It's a rule that Soderbergh has used so many times. Like he cast the informant entirely with funny people Mm. and, and didn't have them play comic roles. He just wanted to know what it would do to the energy. And it's ingenious. I mean, you've got a movie where like Patton Oswalt and Joel, uh, Joel McHale are, are arguing FBI policy. And they're doing it straight, but it's yeah. it's kind of funny. It's you 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 can see where they want to go. You can see where the inclination of the performance goes. And Slate does that with a really vulnerable, gentle thing uh, in her scenes with Foster. And then you have her scenes with Bautista, where he's just he's incredibly sweet to her because she's injured and he's he can't help it. Like he's taking he's taking care of her. And it just again it just changes the dynamic. And also we know how funny Bautista can be. So. Everything is just lined up. It's, yeah, it's a delight. Now, I mean, it's so funny because this was released, I mean, I want to say like June 2018. And I mean, I remember them selling it as this sort of half wick, half dystopian sort of action thriller. But really, it's when you get down to the movie, it's basically a character drama, but with a lot of blood and a lot of guns. And and I mean, I'm kind of curious, like, why do you think maybe this didn't work theatrically? Because as I watch it now again for the second time, I'm like, this is the perfect fucking Netflix movie. (laughs) This is the kind of movie Netflix should be making. Yeah. Well, I mean, it was barely released at the time. Um, It was picked up by a really small distributor in the States, in Canada. We only got it by accident, I think. It was part of a a larger deal that Cineplex released to like two theaters in every city and yeah. i mean it barely played um it was really hard to find i'm not even sure you can get the blu-ray up here i had to go buy it in the in the u.s that thanksgiving yeah yeah and um it's just under distributed underrepresented and i think part of that is that drew pierce made it for nothing on his own like he didn't have a, a distributor behind it when he made the film and he sold it was a negative pickup he sold it to someone once it was finished and i guess when you write Marvel movies and Fast and Furious movies and Mission Impossible movies, that's possible. You can you can finance a movie that way. But it really, the fact that it got played in theaters at all is a kind of a small miracle or an accident. I'm not sure. Maybe Cineplex had a hole they needed to plug that week. But um, yeah, it just, it's exactly the kind of movie that 10 years from now, people will stumble across. And, and the title's kind of off-putting too. It sounds like it might be a, a dystopian movie like the island where a bunch of clones sit around and wait to be dead or yeah maybe you know it's the last man on earth kind of situation or it could be a space shuttle called the hotel artemis that's floating forever waiting right, right, never right. To land. like the title is so vague that you can create any kind of expectation out of it it's the same reason you know like they should have called lockout space jail they didn't it's a huge <laughs> mistake <laughs> Because 10 years later now, like people will be saying, hey, I really like that Space Jail movie. You should check it out. Oh, yeah. What's that called? Space Jail? It's like, no, Lockout. Well, that's dumb. Hotel Artemis, who knows, in 2028, when the film actually takes place, we will be discovering it and saying, oh, that was prescient. Um, but I think it's, it is the kind of thing that people just keep stumbling over. You'll, you'll search for the actor that you like and he'll be in this. Or you'll look at the, you know, like the five, a BuzzFeed list of five movies you don't know Jodie Foster is in, and this will be the number one pick. And 
the great thing about that is people do get to discover it forever. They don't, it doesn't stay lost. Um, I'm trying to think of an equivalent movie. There must be like Carpenter must have made three of these where they just sort of went under the radar and then had a renaissance For sure. maybe in the mouth of madness, right? That one really goes to its... Mars. It goes goes from... to Mars. Yeah. Tanked theatrically, but became a hit on DVD. Um, but it's exactly that sort of movie. And I don't know, I don't know that it is possible to make a cult film on purpose because people who try end up doing something that's too self-aware right. or not self-aware enough. But this, I think this is what you would get if you set out to do that. If you just wanted to make a really great B picture that flies under the radar and is terrific and has something for everyone, I think you end up with Hotel Artemis. Do you think the actors and directors and performers in, in something like this get a perverse pleasure in sort of, I mean, obviously everyone loves everything to be a hit right away and be recognized and yada, yada, yada. But how much sort of inner joy do you think these people get from sort of having that one person come up to them on the street going, I loved Hotel Artemis, you know, as opposed to people going, oh man, Hobbs and Shaw, I love that movie, you know? Yeah, I, I bet that happens way more than we think it does now that everything is everywhere at once. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, in the, in the nineties or the, the early two thousands, if I was interviewing somebody that I that had something that I really, like, I, Lance Henriksen was so happy to talk about the pit and the pendulum, uh, cause it's one of his rare, it's a full leading performance. It's this terrible full moon features knockoff from like post, um, well, it was made by Stuart Gordon after reanimator and it was just Charles Band threw some money at him and he made this really, really cheap film in, I think Spain, maybe Italy, um, vaguely based on mask of the red death or sorry uh, vaguely based on the story uh, and uh the edgar Allan poe story and Henriksen, he shaved his head for it he goes full tilt into this ridiculous performance as, as torquemada who is like a, a sadomasochistic sexual compulsive who sits and quietly touches himself when people confess to horrible pain and he is having the best time and i got to interview him a couple of years later and i said can we talk about Pit in the pendulum. He said, "No one ever asks," and it was great. We just had this long conversation about a role that really meant something to him, and I think you get that sense here in a couple of the performances where people are just delighted to be in this kind of movie, um, and that that is the reason they make it right. Like Sterling K. Brown gets an offer to do to play the to play the lead or the co lead in a crime picture set in the near future where the world is on fire. And it's like, yeah, why wouldn't he? No, you're absolutely right. I mean, I even have a similar story with Kathy Moriarty. I remember I was interviewing her once for some, uh, it was like some horrible kids movie that mm. she was stuck in. But I just, I kept wanting to talk to her about Copland. And it just, <laughs> you could see their eyes sure. light up and just like, oh, thank God, I could have a conversation about something. Yeah, it's not about us confessing that we're total nerds for their career. I think it's the recognition that, you know, oh yeah, I like that too. Like it's an appreciation of something. I'm, and hopefully, you know, when it happens, when I get the opportunity to ask somebody about some relatively obscure project, it's not going to be obscure because they hated it and tried to bury it. It's hopefully the reason I responded to it is the reason they responded to it. It was just a fun picture, something they could do that was different or a chance to, you know, play instead of act. And I mean, and that's, I think that's the joy of the job for them. And I think it's the joy of the job for us when we get to see something like this, that's, you know, while it's got a very familiar mold, it's just a little off kilter enough to be really pleasant and really kind of enjoyable in sort of the universe it's taking us down the road in. And yeah, I, yeah, yeah, there's a phrase I use every now and then, and sometimes I feel guilty about it because it sounds like it's dismissive, but it's really not. The phrase is that this is better than it needed to be. Yeah, exactly. Uh, because so much of the stuff we see is just about ticking boxes yeah. and making sure that the, like this quadrant is satisfied with the action and this quadrant is satisfied with the comedy and this actor gets a moment of, you know, this close up or that shot, or it's, it's about, it's about meeting expectations, but there are very few films that are determined to exceed expectations. And hotel Artemis is absolutely the work of somebody who knows what you think you're going to get from this kind of film and just wants to make a good one. Well, and I mean, I think he did, and it's it's yeah. a great film that it's still on Netflix Canada, so people should go check it out. And you know what, Norm? Thanks for the time today, man. This was this was fun. I appreciate this. Oh, it's my pleasure. Anything that gets people to see this movie, you know, that's that is the fun of it. I, I keep writing about it because it's still out there, and every now and then I get the chance to say, "Oh yeah, no, this movie's great, and you should know about it." It's it's kind of like it was with Galaxy Quest around two thousand and four. I'm with you on that, yeah. <laughs> when people didn't believe that you could make a movie with Tim Allen that was a Star Trek parody that was actually great. <laughs> you just have to get it in front of them. And once they watch it, they'll understand.
Well, you know what? Get Hotel Artemis in front of you on Netflix Canada and you will understand like we do. Norm, thanks for the time today, man. This was fun. Oh, my pleasure. Enjoy your vacation. I will, man. Thank you. And don't forget to, to visit our friends over at Bay Street Video for all your DVD, Blu-ray rental or purchasing needs this summer as they are still open for curbside and some mailing delivery as well. Over at 1172 Bay Street, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, you can give them a call at 416-964-9088. That's 416-964-9088. Or send them an email at baystreetvideoto at gmail.com for any of your DVD and Blu-ray needs.